Well, dear friends, please turn with me in your Bibles to the second letter of the Apostle Paul to the Thessalonians. Two Thessalonians in the New Testament, or second Thessalonians. And chapter one, verse six, second Thessalonians, chapter one. And verse six. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And our subject this evening as we continue in our theories through this letter is divine details of the day of judgment. Divine details of the day of judgment. And well, we ended last week on uh, verse 5, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer. And uh, well, we considered what these uh, words meant. The people of God in every age, they will suffer. They will suffer persecution because of what they believe, because of the stand that they make, because of their faith in Christ, because of their desire to live godly lives, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And well, uh, many of us know persecution, of course, in this country, the persecution is, uh, uh, well, it's intellectual, but there are many parts of uh, the world which we know of where the persecution is uh, very intense and violent, murderous even. In fact, well, this time last year, there was a, a government report issued that uh, stated that the persecution of Christians in parts of the world is at near genocide levels. That was uh, an, a report that was published last year. And uh, the foreign secretary uh, at the time, Jeremy Hunt, he endorsed that. And, uh, well, we often hear of persecution, severe persecution in uh, many places across the world, Nigeria, the Middle East, North Korea, and so on. And, well, uh, what are we to think when we hear about the suffering of the Lord's people, the persecution of the Lord's people, when we hear about how they suffer and their oppressors, their persecutors, appear to get away with it. What are we to think? Well, so often we think, why? Why is this happening? If there is a God, and uh, if these are the Lord's people, why is God not protecting his people? Why is he not bringing justice to bear? Is not God a God of justice? Do we not read in the scriptures that he will not allow sin to go unpunished? Well, what is happening? Why is uh, justice not being seen at the present time? Well, that confirms to us that if justice is not being seen at the present time, there will most certainly come a day of judgment. There will most certainly come a day of justice. If we see the Lord's people suffering now and nothing being done now, the oppressors seem to get away with it. Well, that ought to confirm that a day of judgment must surely come. God is a God of justice. God will see that every sin will be punished. So there must be, there must be a day of judgment that will surely come. It ought to impress upon our hearts that that day will come and will not be avoided. And that is what is uh, being spoken of here by the Apostle Paul which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God. Your sufferings, they are a token, they are an evidence, as it were, of the day of judgment that will surely come. Because that is the day when all wrongs will be made right at the hand of the Almighty God. Justice will be done. And the day of judgment, it is a day of justice. It is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation. And I've spoken about this very often in time past, so I won't go in detail. 
but the world, how does the world view the day of judgment? The day of judgment, oh, it's unfair. It's not fair. It's a cruel thing for God to judge the people of the world, not according to the scriptures. It is a righteous thing. It is a just thing. It's a day of justice, not of unfairness. It is a day that is completely fair when all the wrongs shall be made right. It's not unfair at all. It's the exact opposite. It's perfect justice. God will come and make sure that perfect justice is done in this world. It is only God who can perfectly execute justice. Men cannot perfectly execute justice. The justice, well, when men judge one another, they are either too lenient or too severe. That's the justice of men, either too lenient or too severe. But the justice of God is perfect. It is not too lenient. It is not too severe. It is exactly what we deserve. God's justice will be exact and it will be right. It will be a righteous thing. It will be a righteous day, a day of glorious righteousness. And God will come in that day specifically to avenge his people. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Romans, well, he said, dearly beloved, writing to Christians, of course, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. This is why we as Christian people, we do not need to seek vengeance in this life. If the world hurts us, if the world injures us and persecutes us, well, we don't hurt them back. We don't have to hate them back. We don't have to persecute them back. The world, well, the world says if somebody hits you, you hit them back. That's the attitude of the world. But for a Christian, well, that is not the way. Of course, we are to love our enemies. We are to do good to them who hate us. We are to pray for them that despitefully use us and persecute us. Is that not unfair? Where's the justice in that? If people hurt us and injure us and we're being kind to them, is that not unfair? Well, there is that day of judgment coming. That's what we that's how we remember it. And that's how we live. That's how we can afford to be kind to those who persecute us, because there is that day of judgment coming. We don't have to retaliate. We simply give way to God. We give way to his justice. We give place unto wrath. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. And so this is how we are peaceful, a peaceful people to the rest of the world, even though the world hates us. Well, we do not have any place for vengeance because the Lord will come one day to avenge his people. And well, there is a great sense in which the Lord's people, well, they are the focal point of the day of judgment. Now, uh, some of you may be surprised when I say that. Is not Christ the focal point of the day of judgment? Well, of course, everybody will see the Lord Jesus Christ on that great day when he returns. Everyone will proclaim him as the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. But why is Christ coming? Why is Christ coming? Why is he returning? It's for his people. It's for his people. There is a great sense in which the Lord's people are the great focal point on the day of judgment. Christ comes to avenge his people. It's so often couched in that way, the day of judgment. It's the day of vengeance for his people. Christ is coming to vindicate his people, to show to the whole world that his people were right. The, the rest of the world were wrong. The rest of the world followed after idols. The rest of the world dismissed the gospel. The rest of the world dismissed the word of God, thought it was all rubbish. But God's people were right. Christ is coming to vindicate his people. Christ is coming to gather 
his people. His people. It's for his people that he is coming. Christ is coming, and we shall see this in a few moments, to be glorified in his people. Christ's glory is to be seen, well, in many ways on the day of judgment, but in his people. That is a great part of the glory of Christ on the day of judgment. And so uh, this is what we remember when we consider the day of judgment. We often think of the day of judgment, and this is right, as God judging the world for the wickedness of the world, for the sins of the world. That's perfectly true. But, uh, well, it's for his people. It's to vindicate the Lord's people. It has as much to do about the people of God as it does about the judgment of the world. It's the church that will be vindicated on that day. And, well, in verse 6, it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. The judgment day is righteous, as I have said, and it is a day of recompense. Seeing it as a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. In this world, in this life, the children of God, the saints, will know tribulation. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said that. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But look what happens when Christ comes again. Now the tribulation is for those who troubled us. Those who troubled us will face tribulation. Now it will be their turn. The tables will be turned. And well, this keeps the Lord's people in the right place. This keeps the, Lord, the Lord's people free from envy. It is so easy for the Lord's people, even the Lord's people, to be envious when we see the prosperity of the wicked in this world, when we see uh, unbelievers, well, uh, in their ease and in their riches, doing whatever they want to do. And we, by comparison, well, we live uh, relatively poor lives. Compared to those unbelievers, we live poor and humble lives because of our faith. Because we choose, as it were, the narrow way, the difficult way, striving against sin and the world and temptation. Our lot is so difficult when we look at the unbeliever. Oh, it seems so easy for them. Is it not so easy for us to be tempted to envy? Oh, this is such a temptation for Christian people. But dear friends, we must remember that a day is coming when they shall have to face the tribulation. This is the realization of Asaph in Psalm 73. We know that Psalm so well. Psalm 73, Asaph was envious at the prosperity of the wicked. And well, then he went and he communed with God, and then he understood. Psalm 73, well, he says to the Lord, Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. How are they brought into desolation? As in a moment, they are utterly consumed with terrors. Asaph remembered, yes, in this life, in this world, the unbeliever will have all sorts of riches and pleasures. But in a moment, they will be cast down. They will be utterly consumed with terrors. And it kept Asaph from envy. Then he saw how foolish it was to envy the wicked, because in a moment when the Lord Jesus Christ comes again, they will be utterly cast down. That keeps us from envy, this realization. It helps us to lead, to continue to live these godly lives, knowing that we do not need to envy what uh, the unbeliever and the wicked have in a moment, the pomp and pride of this world will be brought down to nothing. And this is what is being communicated here. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. The tables will be turned. And verse 7, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels well what does this, what does this mean and to you who are troubled rest with us 
Well, this is speaking of rest for Christian people. When the Lord Jesus Christ returns, that means rest for Christian people. Rest from all our labors. And that's a glorious thing. But rest with us, the Apostle Paul adds. That's interesting. To you who are troubled, rest with us. With us, with Paul, with Silas, with Timothy, with all the redeemed saints. Heaven is not a solitary place. Thank God it's not a solitary place. Heaven is not a place where we have to self-isolate. We will all be together. And how precious a thought that is, particularly at this time, we will all be together, united in a way we can never imagine in this life, in this world. There will be no restriction to our togetherness. There will be no division of any kind at all. No division between nation, between race, between social group. No divisions at all. No awkwardness. No want of things to say or do, no language barrier. We will be able to converse freely. There will be nothing to spoil our relationships. We will be righteous people. There will be nothing in us, no wickedness to spoil our relationships one with another. There will be no time limit. No time limit in our relationships. We often say in this world, do we not? I often say it, that we never know how long we have left with one another. That's the way in this world. But then it won't be the case. We will have forever with one another. There will be no time limit. It will not be applicable in that eternal age. We shall forever be with one another. We have a bond that cannot be broken in the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, well, we will be with those, our loved ones who have gone before us into glory. Those who had faith, like precious faith with us, we will be with them in the eternal glory. So don't miss those two words. To you who are troubled, rest, yes, that's a glorious thing, with us. What a terrible thing it would be. I was thinking about this just the other day. What a terrible thing if heaven. Well, if you were the only person in heaven, you were the only one in heaven, that wouldn't be heaven at all. But it's going to be rest with us, a glorious place of unity and perfect relationship one with another. To you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels And well, we constantly remind ourselves of this. The Lord Jesus Christ, he will come upon the clouds of heaven with the holy angels. How different this is to his first coming. What a contrast between his first coming and his second coming. Remember his first coming in a lowly stable, laid to rest in a manger in tiny, insignificant Bethlehem, living a life of poverty as a despised Nazarene and then ultimately crucified on a cross. Well, now this same Jesus, look at the difference. Well, I quote from one of the hymns in our hymn book. It's a glorious hymn, hymn number 300, The Lord Shall Come. But I quote just a a couple of verses because these are glorious, as one in lowliness he came, a silent lamb before his foes, a weary man and full of woes. That was his first coming, but his second, the Lord shall come in glorious form with rainbow wreath and robes of storm on cherub wings and wings of wind, appointed judge of all mankind. A glorious contrast in that hymn, and there will be a glorious contrast. Well, in a way, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ is made glorious because of the contrast, because of the way that he came the first time. It was so humble. It was so poor. It will only add greater glory to his second coming. It adds to his glory, the contrast. And this is so often the way. 
with the things of God revealed to us in the scriptures. It's the contrast that makes things more glorious. And this will be the case with the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, so different to the first time he came. And verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, these are solemn things. Taking vengeance on them that know not God. We can only know God through the gospel, through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only way to God, the only way to his mercy, to God's grace, to God's love. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the only way we can know these things. There will sadly be many who claim that they know God on that day. There will be many from other religions who claim that they know God and that they will, they will try to approach God and say, did we not know thee? Did I not do this and this and this? But they didn't come through Christ. They didn't know Christ. They rejected Christ. They rejected the Son of God. And so, therefore, they must face the consequences. The Apostle John in 1 John 5, 12, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. It is only through Christ. Look at those who will have to face the vengeance of God. They are those who knew not God and that obeyed not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, the gospel, that he is the way, the truth and the life. So, dear friends, we must know this. We cannot, we do not have any basis in scripture to say that those of other religions, those of other faiths will be saved on the last day. There is no basis. It's only those who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, those who know the Son. And then verse 9, because time is running on. Who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Again, these are solemn things. We find it hard to focus upon these things and particularly the doctrine that is being shown to us in this particular verse, the doctrine of everlasting destruction, eternal torment, eternal hell. So many people, even theologians and Christians, they shy away from this doctrine, that those who are unsaved will be punished eternally. And yet, dear friends, this is most certainly spelled out for us in the scriptures. It's here. In 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 9, but this is not the only place in which we read such uh, solemn things. We read in Matthew 18 and verse 8, the Lord Jesus Christ, wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Everlasting fire. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 25, verse 41. Again, the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand. These are the unsaved on the day of judgment. Those on the left hand, he will say to them, depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels there will be everlasting torment for the unbeliever in hebrew 6 verse 2 when uh, uh, the foundational truths of the gospel are being spelled out for them for us look at what is being mentioned well the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Eternal judgment, that's included among the foundational truths of the gospel. So we cannot 
get away from it. And what we read from Mark chapter 9 and those terrible words that the unbeliever is sent to a place where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. The fire is not quenched. And that's repeated in Mark chapter 9. So, dear friends, this is something that we ought to acknowledge and to accept as the teaching of the word of God. Many people like to believe that unbelievers, well, yes, they are condemned, but they are annihilated. They do not suffer eternal punishment. They are annihilated. They go into non-existence. But as I've just shown you from the scriptures, that is not the teaching of the scripture. And furthermore, that would downplay the suffering of Christ on the cross. You know, the clearest view of the agony of hell is what we see on the cross of Calvary, is the account that we have of Christ's sufferings on the cross. On the cross of Calvary, Christ suffered our hell for us. He suffered our eternal punishment for us. That is what he did on the cross, an eternity of punishment. And of course, well, many people ask you, how can the Lord Jesus Christ have suffered an eternity of punishment in six hours? How can an eternity of punishment be compressed into a period of time? Well, dear friends, of course, this is a great mystery. But we know that hell is eternal. And so we know that Christ must have suffered an eternity of punishment. And of course, he is the eternal God. It proves that this is God who is suffering on the cross. It's not an angel. It's not a created being. They could never bear an eternity of punishment. It's only the eternal, everlasting God, the God who stretches out eternity before him. It's only he who can bear an eternal punishment. It's only the living God. This is one of the evidences that we have, that Christ is God because he suffered our eternal punishment. But when we read of Christ suffering on the cross, it is a conscious suffering. He is uh, crying out. He is in agony. He is very conscious of his suffering. He's not being annihilated. He's not unconscious of it. He hasn't gone into non-existence. He is, su he is conscious of his sufferings. He is conscious that he has been forsaken of God. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This is a conscious suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. So to say that people are annihilated, they just uh, cease to exist, that downplays the suffering of Christ on the cross, where he consciously bore all our sins away. Our hell was laid upon him. So, dear friends, it's not annihilation. The suffering of unbelievers is eternal. And dear friends, yes, that's a tragic thing. That's a very serious thing. And that ought to make us. What is the effect of believers through this teaching? How does it affect us practically? Well, it helps us. It compels us rather to take our religion seriously, far more seriously than we otherwise would. You know, churches that have banished the idea of hell and have banished the idea, most certainly, of everlasting punishment. Churches that banish that idea, well, they're not very serious. They're not very serious at all. The church has become just like a social club and everything is light and trivial and, and frothy. They lose all their seriousness because, well, they've abandoned the most serious part of it that everlasting destruction for the believers. This ought to help us realize how serious Christianity is, how serious our work is, and it ought to make us ever zealous for the lost. I've spoken about this at great length recently, but it ought to make us, well, take on greater zeal to reach out to the lost and to speak to people about Christ we ought never to think, oh, that person's not a Christian, that family member's not a Christian, but it doesn't really matter, does it? 
Yes, it does matter. It does matter because we read in the scriptures that if they are not saved before the Lord Jesus Christ comes, there is a terrible torment for them. So we have to do all that we can to reach out to them, all that we can, and pray for them with greater earnestness. These are the practical effects of this doctrine upon us. But dear friends, time is almost out entirely, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. But let us, uh, in our final moments, let us just look at verse 10. When he, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Well, when Christ shall come, this is the meaning of this verse, he will be glorified in his saints, in all them that believe. We have read of how Christ will come with the holy angels in the glory of the Father, and that will be his glory, of course, coming in the glory of the Father. There is no greater glory, but there is a great sense in that he will be glorified in us. That will be his glory. The saints will be his glory on that day of judgment. What will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ in us? Well, let me just give you a few things before we close. Our faith will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. Our faith on that last day, our faith in things unseen, our faith in the cross, the faith that could never be taken from us, the faith, well, that remained with us even unto death. We were prepared to die for our faith. That will be revealed on the last day, the tremendous faith of the saints. And that will be the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ will be glorified through our faith, through our works. Where there is faith, there will always be works. Remember that our labors for the Lord will glorify him. Our labors in the church, all our service, our tireless endeavors, that will be the glory of the Lord. All our prayers, our labors in prayer, all the hours that we put into prayer in our closets, praying without ceasing, all our evangelism, all the ways that we have been granted instrumentality. It will be a glorious thing on that final day to know that the saints, the saints of God, have been used of God as instruments to gather all the other saints in. All the saints have been gathered because the Lord has been pleased to use the saints themselves as instruments. Oh, what a glorious thing that will be. The glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Our victories will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. What victories? Our victories over sin, all the times we've resisted temptation, all our uh, victories of love one for another, even though we were weak and feeble Christians and often let one another down, our love prevailed, that unbreakable bond that we have. And the fact, of course, and this is very important, that we will all be there on the last day. We've touched on this already. We will all be there. All the elect, all those who were predestinated before the foundation of the world. Before the world began, there was an elect predestinated to be saved. And now at the end of the world, all of those elect are there. Not one is lost, not a single one. And that will be to the glory of Christ. Not a single one of God's elect will be lost. This is Christ's glorious finished work. All his people gathered up to be with him. What a glory. And well, we will enter into glory, everlasting glory, because Christ has died for us. We've spoken about everlasting punishment 
But let's think about the everlasting glory of the saints. Everlasting peace, everlasting joy, that which we do not deserve. None of us deserve heaven. Hell, hell is a place that unbelievers deserve. It's a just place for unbelievers, but heaven is a place that we do not deserve. And yet we receive it freely forever and ever and ever. We will never be parted from heaven. We will never lose our place in heaven. And that place is freely available for all who simply believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no use grumbling about hell because we can all have heaven freely if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Why would you not believe and have that everlasting joy that cannot be taken from you? This is the way we will glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the attitude that we must have when we go into this coming week. We must strive to be better people. We must strive to resist sin and temptation. We must strive to be holy, to love one another. We must strive to be kind because on that great and coming day, all our strivings, all our victories, all our labors will be part of the glory of our returning Lord. Do we not want to glorify him on that coming day? Let us do our best, dear friends. Let us deny ourselves as never before in this coming week so that when Christ shall appear, a great part of his glory will be those things that you have done in your life this week, this day. Oh, dear friends, what a glorious thought that is. These are just some of the divine details of that great and coming day of judgment. Well, may the Lord bless all these things to us. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, our gracious God and our loving Heavenly Father, oh dear Lord, how we pray that thou wouldest help each and every one of us to glorify thy holy name in the days ahead. Lord, we thank thee that there is that great and coming day of judgment when all wrongs shall be made right, when thy people shall be vindicated, when thy people shall be gathered together, we shall forever spend eternity in one another's presence and in the presence of the Lamb who suffered our eternal punishment for us. Oh, dear Lord, be pleased to bless each and every one of us and draw us nearer to thyself. We ask it all in our Saviour's name and for his sake. Amen.